number one of Bible 101, Bibliology and Bible Overview, the Doctrine of the Book of God. This is a class that is being provided by the New Covenant College uh, out of Kentucky. And the New Testament Baptist Church of Dover, Tennessee is partnering with New Covenant College and to offer this class to you. My name is Kenneth Glish, and I'll be the professor for these studies. This is a two-hour class. Uh, it will run for 20 weeks. If you are taking the class, um, you will have available to you online a syllabus. At, and uh, if you would, take a look at that, and I'll go over that with you. I want to begin by uh, giving some just general acknowledgments for this class. And I'm really indebted to two chief scholars. I'm indebted to... Uh, Dr. Edward Freer Hills, who is a uh, leading expert or was a leading expert in this field throughout his ministry. And also, I am greatly indebted to Dr. Edward Overby, the late professor there at Lexington Baptist College. And his studies in bibliology, his studies in Bible overview have been a great blessing. And it's our joy to be able to present this material to you. Okay, if you're looking at your syllabus, let's go over the requirements for this course. So, of course, uh, you, you will need to view all of these lectures, which, as I said, will be 20 of them. Uh, you'll want to make sure that you take notes on those lectures and uh, submit those at the end of the course, uh, either through photocopy or uh, if you are taking this at one of our American institutes, you want to make sure that whoever is facilitating that gets a copy of those notes and also internationally you want to make sure that uh, those notes are being submitted at the end of the course so however you're uh, keeping those notes just make sure you hold on to them till the end of the course you want to read the textbook in its entirety the textbook is the King James Version defended by Edward Freer Hills uh, which is also uh, republished as uh, Text and Time. It was the republished to that. Text and Time. And now the original edition, the King James Version Defended, don't get too caught up with that title. The book is not nearly as much about the King James Version as it is bibliology as a whole. He did title it that, and his thesis throughout uh, the King James Version Defended is that if you have a consistent bibliology and you understand the doctrine of inspiration, the doctrine of preservation, um, and you take that to a logical conclusion, you'll wind up with the authorized version in your hand because that is a faithful translation of the text that God's people have always had and received as the authentic Word of God. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a great book explaining bibliology, and it's a much-needed study in our day and age. So uh, that would definitely be one of the requirements for this course is to read that book in its entirety. I recommend you obtaining a hard copy, a paper copy, However, I know online, on Amazon, you can find a Kindle edition. And uh, I will also be including in our uh, educational platform through New Covenant a, a link to a free PDF version where you can view that book for free. But I do recommend getting a, a hard copy if you have the ability to. Also, you want to read any supplementary assigned readings. Perhaps periodically throughout the course, I might... Um, give you an essay or give you a, a, a paper to read that will just be for that week's lecture. You want to make sure that you read that and, and get that material. Uh, they say a Bible degree is reading and writing and reading and writing and then a little bit of reading and writing. So we want to make sure that, that we're being studious in all of that. And then also completing all course exams. So periodically throughout the uh, course, after we get done with certain subjects, there might be a weekly examination. That's just to really ensure that you're getting the material, that you are comprehending and understanding what we're discussing in these lectures. Uh, so make sure that you take care of that. It'll be self-grading. So wherever you're taking this class, uh, whether via an institute or uh, wherever you happen to be taking it, you'll be able to get that, and then the facilitator will have the rubric and the answer key to be able to grade that assignment. So also on your syllabus, there's a bibliography at the end. You'll note that. Those are not required uh, readings, um, I, except for, of course, uh, the, the textbook, which you'll see 
Edward Freer Hills's other book, Believing Bible Study, is on that bibliography. But none of these books on the bibliography are required readings. However, they are a, um, just a list of really good books on this subject if you're looking for more information. Some of this deals with the textual issue. Some of it deals with Bible overview. So I'd recommend if you're wanting to dig a little deeper, and I um, put a little asterisk beside three of them that I especially recommend. So that would be your syllabus for this class. Again, Bible 101, it's an introductory level class, and it is a two-credit hour class. Uh, so that is what we have to look forward to. All right, um, I want to just give you a general course overview and explain the program of study for these weeks. And really this class can be divided roughly into three sections that are not equal sections, but three sections. The first section, we are titling the, the author of the Bible or the authorship of the Bible. So uh, I'll put uh, author, um, authorship. So author or uh, authorship of the Bible. And under this section, what we're primarily going to be looking at is who wrote the Bible? Uh, how was the Bible written? How is the Bible preserved? What is the history of its preservation? Is it even preserved? Some say no to some extent. Some say yes to some extent. So what is preservation of the Scriptures? And to what extent is the Bible preserved? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the translation of the Bible, the act of getting the Bible in, from one language into another and what entail, is entailed by that process. Then we're going to look at some false views of preservation. Some false views of preservation. You can really think about it this way. The doctrine of preservation is kind of like the, the tie that binds because translation and uh, uh, all of the different versions and editions, they all center around preservation. So if you get preservation right, you get your theory of translation right. Uh, also, perhaps we'll be able to discuss some of the debated and controversial texts. Uh, some, there's some texts that especially within the Word of God, several passages and verses that are especially debated and a lot of um, go back and forth, a lot of talk goes on as to whether or not they should be in our Bibles. There's some verses that some say... Uh, perhaps the earlier and better manuscripts don't contain, and therefore we shouldn't have them as the inspired Word of God. And some say that, um, that there are some versions that add things that were scribal editions. So we're going to try to get into a little bit of that. So that will be section number one. Section number two. Uh, section number two is the reader of the Bible or the readership of the Bible. And in this section, we're going to be giving a general overview of the books of, uh, or excuse me, uh, that's, that's the third section. In this section, the reader of the Bible, we're going to be giving some principles of interpretation. Some principles of interpretation. Uh, how to study and read your Bible. Uh, that's a very important preliminary discussion. Before you can go to the text of Scripture and figure out what it's teaching and get the meaning from it, you want to make sure that you have correct principles of interpretation when you approach that text. It's very important that we do that. And under this section, the readership of the Bible, we'll also be covering what is called the science of hermeneutics, the science of hermeneutics. And then our third section, which will conclude this, this class, is the content or the contents of the Bible. The contents of the Bible. And this will be a general Bible overview. So giving you the overall narrative of Scripture from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. Uh, we'll cover the, the Bible as it is given to us in sections. We have the Pentateuch and we have the historical books. We have the poetical books. We have the prophetical books, we have the Gospels and Acts, we have the Pauline epistles, and we have the general epistles. So that's what we'll be discussing in that third section. I want to talk a little bit about what our objectives are in this course. Uh, what is 
the purpose of this course? Why would we teach this course? A lot of Bible colleges and a lot of uh, uh, courses will just throw in bibliology at the first maybe one or two weeks of perhaps New Testament survey or New Testament introduction. But we felt that it would be very helpful to really spend an extensive amount of time on the subject of bibliology. Uh, why is that? Well, let me, let me start off by saying to you that bibliology literally means the study of the doctrine of the Bible. You can see that in the word uh, bibli, Bible, and ology, the study of. So it's the study of the Bible. But it's not studying the doctrines taught in the Bible. It is studying the Bible as a doctrine itself. So it's, it's studying the Bible as a doctrine, the doctrine of the Bible. That's why the subtitle of this course is the doctrine of the book of God. So we're going to be looking at the nature, the form, the composition, and the history of Scripture. Now let me give you an illustration. Think of the Bible as a castle with many, many rooms and hallways and corridors. The Bible as a whole represents that castle, and all of those rooms and hallways and corridors represent the books within it. Now, we can go into one room. Let's say we go into the, the, the room of Nehemiah, and we study that room, Nehemiah. Um, but what we're going to be doing is not going into those individual rooms, but we're going to be out in the front yard and in the backyard and all around studying the whole castle how it was constructed, the history of its construction, how it was put together, when it was constructed. That is what we're talking about when we talk about bibliology. And um, let me also say as a word of caution, we will be discussing faulty views of things like inspiration and preservation and authenticity, but don't get the idea that this class is polemical. This is not a polemical class. What we are seeking to do is positively assert the doctrine of bibliology as taught in the scriptures. And we will only be touching on some of those opposing positions as they are relevant to the discussion. Now I know that this subject uh, genders a lot of animosity and a lot of tension. And uh, sometimes it makes for really good preaching. And it makes for a really good opportunity to get on our soapbox and rant and rave on the other side. But we're going to avoid that as much as we possibly can. Because uh, truth be told, the best way to defend your position is to just positively assert it. And uh, we're not seeking to advance any uh, sectarian position or, or any one camp. We simply want to know what the Bible has to say about bibliology. Uh, let me talk to you a little bit about the importance of bibliology, the importance of bibliology. One of the essential questions that bibliology seeks to answer is this. Do we have the Word of God? Do we have it? Is it available to us today? Can we honestly say that we have God's Word? And we're going to be asking that question both canonically and textually. What do I mean? Well, the canon of Scripture, the, the books in the Bible. How can we know that these 66 books of the Bible are all of God's Word? How do we know that we're not missing some? How do we know that there's, a, that there's some in here that shouldn't be in here? Okay, We're going to ask that question. Do we have God's Word canonically? And also, and it's a very uh, closely related issue, do we have God's Word textually? So let's say that we can, we can say, yes, we have God's Word canonically, but how do we know that within the books themselves there's not some verses that should be there that aren't, or some verses that are there that shouldn't be? And we're going to get into that as well. Do we have God's Word? How do we know if we have it or if we don't have it? And let me say this, the reason why this is so important. Because the Bible is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of knowledge, faith, and obedience, it is absolutely imperative that we have the Word of God. So let me, let me in a sense, teach the rest of this course with the cards face up. I, I believe, and I believe that the Bible is clear, that we have the Word of God. We have it. 
And we affirm that God has delivered His Word and preserved it, and we are in possession of it today. We are in possession of it today. And we affirm this because of what the doctrine of bibliology teaches. So we're going to be studying bibliology so that we can uh, have a consistent footing whereupon we can make such claims that we have the Word of God. Another reason why bibliology is so important and really why we felt that this uh, particular subject needed a at least an entire section of a class and not just a week or two is because this is a very technical subject. We're going to learn a lot of vocabulary together. We're going to talk a lot about, a lot about the history of the, the transmission of the text. And um, we're going to get into some really sticky details. And, and it, there might be some times along this course when you, you know, your mind is boggling, you're trying to keep up with what this technical word means and that technical word and the history of this line of manuscripts and this family of texts. But if we're going to be honest and if we're going to study to show ourselves approved, we need to tackle some of those trickier subjects. And one of the reasons why we wanted to give this so much attention is especially in the camp that I know many of you are, are from, being New Covenant College, being a Sovereign Grace Baptist College. Uh, there's a lot of tradition that has entered into our circles, especially concerning the textual issue. And a lot of people hold to a bibliology that is nothing more than a traditional argument. And because of that, a lot of confusion centers around why we practice it the way that we practice it. Whatever Bible you have in your hand, whatever Bible that you use for your studying and your reading, ask yourself, why do you use that particular Bible? Why, why do you use that version and not another? And if the answer is, well, this is just what my family has always used. Well, this is what our church has always used. Well, my granddaddy was saved with this, with this particular version of the Bible. Well, those sentimental arguments might be endearing to us, but unfortunately they're not consistent with any level of scholarship. And uh, there is another aspect of bibliology and another p position on bibliology that does make consistent and coherent arguments. And our traditions just will not stand up to some of those arguments from the other side. I want to read you a quote from a book called The King James Only Controversy, written by Dr. James White. Now, Dr. James White is one of the leading scholars in the modern textual critic camp. And uh, James White says this in the King James Only Controversy. He says, I have found that King James Version only advocates are not only ignorant of the most basic principles of textual criticism, and then he puts in, quote, uh, in, in parentheses, the vast majority of Christians are unaware of the same things, but also, much worse, unwilling to learn. And if we're being honest, I think we have to admit that uh, our brother James White here has some truth to that statement. And I have met people that have kind of had this idea, uh, this, this attitude when it comes to bibliology. Well, what's the point in studying it? I'm settled on this issue. No point in, in studying it. Well, unfortunately, there, there is new, uh, new material being put out, new books being written. And if we're going to be fervent defenders of the faith and what we believe, and if we're going to be consistent and honest with ourselves, I believe that we owe our, ourselves and we owe it to God uh, and to the integrity of His Word to study out this thing called bibliology. So uh, that is why we're doing such an in-depth study of bibliology. So that's section number one uh, of this course, Bibliology and the authorship of it. And uh, Let me talk a little bit about the importance of the principles of interpretation, the, the readership section, which will be uh, the shortest section in this study. The science of hermeneutics, it's the, uh, the rule of biblical interpretation. It is the study of how meaning is conveyed. Hermeneutics is the study of how meaning is conveyed. It's not the interpretation of Scripture itself, but it's the rule of interpreting Scripture. And these principles of interpretation provide us with rules 
on how we are to understand what Scripture is teaching. It is extremely dangerous to approach the Scriptures with a faulty or inconsistent rule of interpretation. It's extremely dangerous. See, anyone can make the Bible say whatever they want as long as they ignore the context of Scripture. There's so many cults and isms out there that have devised all kinds of doctrines simply by coming to the Scriptures with an inconsistent rule of interpretation. And so we want to make sure that we are interpreting the Scriptures consistently. And ultimately, we confess that the Scripture itself is its own rule of interpretation. And because we believe that there are no contradictions in Scripture, because the Bible is consistent, we must interpret it consistently. And we confess that there is only one true interpretation of every passage in the Word of God. Therefore, we must ensure that we are being consistent with our rule of interpretation. The third section, Bible overview, or the contents of the Bible, this is a foundation that must be built in order to properly study the teachings of the Bible, understanding the overall narrative of Scripture. For instance, let's say you wanted to understand Romans 3.14, Romans chapter 3, verse 14. You wanted to know what that verse means. Well, as you study Romans 3.14, it would help to know a little bit about the book of Romans as a whole. Even better if you knew something about Pauline epistles. Even better if you knew something about the New Testament. You, you see what I'm doing. I'm arguing from the lesser to the greater. And so what we're doing is we're going to try to lay out the Bible narrative as a whole, looking at the historical context and who the author was, who the audience was, what the major theme was. And when we do this, think back to that illustration about the big castle with many rooms. When we do this, it helps us when we get down to more specific texts and books. And it lays a solid foundation. Uh, and it's very important that we do this so that when we're interpreting Scripture, we can, we can remain, again, consistent. Law of learning is repeat, repeat, repeat. So if you hear some of these words being repeated, uh, it, it might be good to write them down and jot them down because you'll probably see them again, perhaps on an examination. Lastly, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, something called epistemology. Epistemology, that's one of those words uh, that, that we'll be learning. Epistemology. And specifically, I want to talk about epistemology as it relates to bibliology. Now, the word epistemology... Again, you can see that ology on the end of it, so you know that it uh, probably has to do with the study of something, and if you think that, you're correct. It refers to the study of knowledge, knowledge as a whole, specifically how we know something. Epistemology is how we know something, how we come to understand something. So when you're uh, studying bibliology, the epistemology of bibliology would be, how do we study the doctrine of bibliology? And the answer is, uh, is quite simple. You study it the same way you study any other doctrine in the Bible. See, when you're studying the, the doctrines of the Bible, the doctrine of justification, what is the final authority? What's the final authority for all Bible doctrine? Well, it's the Bible, right? The, the Bible is the final authority for all doctrinal issues. But what about bibliology when we're studying the doctrine of the Bible? Can the Bible be its own authority? That's what we're asking when we talk about the epistemology of bibliology. Where do we begin when we try to understand bibliology? Well, some say that we begin with physical evidence. We begin with manuscripts and we begin with quotes from church history and the early church fathers. And we begin with the findings of the... the uh, Apographa and uh, the things like the Dead Sea Scrolls and extant manuscripts. And we examine this physical evidence to come to our doctrine of bibliology. Other people have said we have to defer to the authority of the church, that ecumenical councils and church decrees 
must determine what books are in the Bible and what verses should be in the Bible. However, we want to affirm that the Bible itself is its own authority. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. This is a very important verse when it comes to bibliology, when it comes to the Word of God in general. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Most of you could probably quote this verse to me. But the Bible says here, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So when we come to the doctrine of bibliology, we want to study it the same way we would study any other doctrine. We want to study bibliology the way we would study any other doctrine, by coming to the Bible and seeing what the Bible has to say about it. Because all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, and that includes the doctrine of bibliology. Now, these other sources, they provide great insight. I'm not saying we should ignore the manuscripts. I'm not saying we should ignore early church fathers. Those, those are testimonies uh, that can be very helpful in trying to figure out certain things. When we, when we want to know the canonicity of a book, we look back to the time in which it was written and we, we see what men that were uh, members of the church had to say about it in their day. And that sheds light on how we should view the book. However, none of those external sources should ever trump the authority of the scriptures themselves. And this is all about consistency. We must approach bibliology the same way we approach other doctrines. And uh, part of the confusion when we talk about bibliology comes from camps that don't do this. They will approach all the doctrines of the Bible the same way except for bibliology. When they want to study the doctrine of creation or creationism, well, they approach the Bible and they look to see what the Bible has to say about it. But then when they get to bibliology, they say, oh, we can't go to the Bible to, to know what the Bible says and is and, and teaches. Uh, I want to uh, close this evening with a quote from Dr. Edward Overby. He answered this quote direct, or this, this objection directly when, uh, when he was asked, can the Bible be its own authority? Here's what Dr. Edward Overby has to say about it. He, he says, Some may wonder, can the Bible be its own authority? Can it define authoritatively what it means quantitatively when it speaks of Scripture, prophecy, etc.? The answer to both questions is yes. It is its own authority. And this authority is as good as its integrity, which is perfect. The highest authority for any matter would be a statement from God. Various men are quoted as authorities on various matters because of their knowledge, wisdom, position, honesty, etc. The highest authority on every matter is God. The Bible claims to be God's Word. So when the Bible speaks about itself, it is God speaking about His Word. By the nature of the case, this is the highest and final authority. The testimony of God in the Bible about the quantity and quality of the Bible is as good as the integrity of the Bible. It is perfect, pure, unbreakable, true, and lasts forever. What is, what is Dr. Overby saying? Dr. Overby is saying that because we believe that God is the final authority for everything, then God's Word, the Bible, is simply God speaking about His Word. Now you say, well, that's circular reasoning. It might be circular reasoning, but circular reasoning is only a fallacy if it circles back to a fallible source. But when it circles back to an infallible source, it's not an issue. And because God is infallible, what He says about His own Word is true. So this lays the foundation for our course of study. We are going to be studying bibliology and Bible overview from the standpoint of a Bible believer. We believe the Bible 
and we come to the Bible as our authority. And that's how we're going to seek to lay out the doctrine of bibliology and Bible overview over the course of this semester. All right, at this time, if you have any questions about anything, I'll be glad to take them. And if not, we'll go our merry ways this evening. Yes. Certainly. So uh, we had two people watching online that asked what book we're going to be using. Uh, the book will be the King James Version Defended by Edward Freer Hills. And that was republished uh, as Text and Time. As Text and Time. Uh, that's available on uh, Kindle format online. And you can probably find a hardcover if you look, look, on, look for it online. Edward Freer Hills was actually a, a Presbyterian scholar in the 50s and 60s. And he wrote from the standpoint of a believing bibliology. And uh, it's, it's a really great book on the philosophy of bibliology uh, as well as the history of preservation and transmission. It's called The King James Version Defended by Edward Freer Hills. Edward F. Hills. All right. Well, no further questions. Yes. Will we look at any of the books that the King James scholars rejected and said they were not canonized? So the, the question is, will we be looking at any of the books um, that have been rejected and were not canonized? The answer to that question is yes, we will be. Uh, there, there are several books um, that, for instance, the Roman Catholic Church uh, would, would say that the apocryphal books are inspired. And in the Council of Trent, I believe, they, they actually canonize those books. And yes, we will be looking at uh, se several of those books and talking about why they're not inspired. So that's a, that's a good question. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in to week number one. If you're watching our live stream, we will see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. God bless you.